some extent, all this talk about carbon dioxide and its effect on warming is a bit like walking into a room and trying to figure out why it's too hot without ever checking the thermostat on the furnace. The sun is clearly the most important driver of climate, and there is a growing body of evidence that cycles in the sun's output, which tend to be linked to its sunspot cycle, have a lot of explanatory power for climatic variations over the last 500 years or so. As you can see, a period of low solar activity, often called the Maunder Minimum, roughly correlates with the Little Ice Age, and we can see the solar output has increased to levels not seen for hundreds of years at the same time we have seen rising temperatures in the 20th century. This fit is not perfect, reinforcing the fact that climate is complicated and multifaceted, but there is compelling evidence that some of the 20th century warming probably can be laid at the doorstep of the sun. More recently, some interesting lab work has been conducted demonstrating that cosmic rays may play an important role in cloud formation. Since the sun's output tends to have a large effect on cosmic rays hitting the Earth, a simple way to think about it is the high solar output shields the Earth from cosmic rays. In this new model, increasing solar output decreases cosmic rays and therefore reduces cloud formation, which in turn raises temperatures. Some preliminary results in a few tests seem to confirm that cosmic rays correlate with cloud formation and tend to amplify changes in solar output. Unfortunately, skeptics have probably leapt into the cosmic ray bandwagon way too soon. If our understanding of greenhouse gases is a 4 of 10, our understanding of cosmic rays is closer to a 1. Nevertheless, it is a good example of how unlikely it is that small concentrations of CO2 at a parts per million concentration level or acting as the only driver of temperature. In conclusion, it is safe to say that almost certainly some of the 0.6 degrees of historical warming can be attributed to natural effects. Over the last several years, upset that past warming has come nowhere near matching the dramatic warming forecasted by their climate models, global warming advocates have hypothesized that there may be other man-made effects that are masking or suppressing greenhouse global warming signals. Specifically, they hypothesize that sulfur dioxide aerosols, which are produced by burning fuels high in sulfur, and black carbon particles, also from, the, from combustion, are reflecting radiation back from the Earth, acting as a cooling effect. If scientists don't understand the magnitude of carbon dioxide's effect on the climate, then they aren't even in the ballpark of understanding aerosols. We do know that while carbon dioxide's effects are global and long-lasting, the effects of aerosols are short-lived and therefore far more local. Cooling effects will be concentrated in the smoke plumes downwind of large land-based industrial sites. This localization effect nearly guarantees that the, the effects of aerosols and particulates will be low. Land only covers about 25% of the globe, and urbanization only a portion of that. That's why the higher concentrations of sulfates and black carbon, as shown in the yellow and orange on these charts, only cover a small part of the Earth's surface in these maps. This localization means that for these aerosols to reduce the world's average temperature by a degree, they would have to reduce temperatures in their local area effect by as much as 10 degrees, something no one has even come close to observing. And since most of these aerosols are concentrated in the northern hemisphere, we would expect that that hemisphere to be cooler when in fact we know from this chart we showed a few minutes ago that exactly the opposite is true. As a result, I believe we can assume that, even considering these masking and cooling effects of aerosols, that something less than six-tenths of a degree of warming can be attributed to man over the last century. Okay, but what does this mean for the future? We've gone quite a ways in this film without once mentioning the dreaded words, climate model and we can draw some fairly robust inferences about future warming scenarios without even getting into them. Suffice it to say that climate models are the best ex modern example of garbage in, garbage out. They are only as good as their basic assumptions, and if models are programmed with the assumption that carbon dioxide will cause a lot of warming, then they will unsurprisingly get the result that carbon dioxide causes a lot of warming. Models tend to have at least three layers of exaggeration that multiply into world-ending catastrophic forecasts. At the front end of the model are economic and technology assumptions that create 100-year CO2 production forecasts. The quality of these assumptions are usually awful, with results that make absolutely no sense as small and not so small errors are allowed to compound for over a century. The result is carbon dioxide forecasts 
way beyond any reasonable level, such that the world is already measurably undershooting these forecasts just a few years after they were made. These carbon dioxide production forecasts are then fed into a climate model of great complexity, but we, which we will simplify in a minute with the notion of climate sensitivity, which is a multiplier or scaling factor between carbon dioxide levels and temperature increases. We will see in a moment, looking at a few historical numbers, that most climate models are using sensitivities way beyond any level justifiable with empirical evidence. After we discuss sensitivities, we will conclude the video by examining some of the cataclysmic projections of changes in the earth from rising oceans to droughts to storms and disease that some tend to project from the temperature forecasts. It turns out we don't need a complicated climate model to reach some first order conclusions about future warming. All we really need to understand is the concept of climate sensitivity. Climate sensitivity is generally defined as the amount of global temperature rise that would result from a doubling of carbon dioxide levels, generally from a pre-industrial concentration of 280 parts per million to 560 parts per million. Remember back to our explanation of the greenhouse effect. Since carbon dioxide only absorbs certain frequencies, there is a diminishing return relationship between CO2 concentrations and temperature increases. So when we look at sensitivity, we would expect that temperature sensitivity to CO2 to be a curve rather than a straight line as shown here. As CO2 increases, which is shown on the bottom axis, then temperature can be expected to rise as well. At low concentrations, an increase in CO2 has a large effect on temperature. However, at higher concentrations, the same increase in CO2 has a much smaller effect on temperature. This is what we mean by diminishing return relationship. We can actually attempt to create this curve based on our past history. Remember that we spent a lot of time demonstrating that the full 0.6 Celsius the historical temperature increase is almost certainly not all due to manned CO2. However, just to make a point, let's assume the worst case, that man-made CO2 has caused the full six-tenths of a degree C of 20th century warming, and see where that takes us. This blue line is drawn so that an increase from 280 to 380 parts per million today yields a temperature increase of 0.6 C. This is the temperature increase we've seen, and the 280 to 380 ppm is the CO2 increase we've seen. Now, extrapolating this out, this means that a full doubling of CO2 to 560 parts per million should give a temperature increase of about 1.2 C, which is only about 6 tenths of a C more than we've seen to date. That doesn't sound too bad. In fact, since a reasonable forecast would not have the world hitting this doubling to 560 parts per million until the late 21st century, this implies that we should see less than a degree of warming in the next century, about in line with what we experienced and survived quite well in the last century. But of course, a number of scientists get warming numbers much larger. They use assumptions about sensitivities that are much higher than the 1.2 we derived as a worst case from historical data. In fact, the minimum sensitivity alarmists use is about three, with many using numbers even higher. What would you have to believe to believe a number even as high as three? This time we'll work backwards on the chart and find that if sensitivity were assumed to be three, we would have had to have seen warming due to man-made carbon dioxide of about one and a half degrees Celsius in the 20th century, a huge number no one has come close to observing for total temperature increase, much less the proportion due to man. This chart is the emperor's new clothes of climate science. It says that to arrive at the forecast you see in the media for catastrophic 21st century warming, there would have to have been man-made 20th century warming many times in excess of what we actually observed. In short, no matter how complicated and how much money is poured into the cl climate models, they make no sense.